Well, welcome everybody to the Life Quest Leadership Line. Uh, this week we have Dr. Craig Little, president of CCE. Um, I, my, I want to take you on a journey and just kind of show you uh, what's been happening in chiropractic education. And I can share a lot about what I've learned being in the seat as president of Life West, but I think it's important for every chiropractor to know that, um, you know, where our education was and where it is and where it's going. So I invited Dr. Little to be on our program today. Welcome, Dr. Craig. Great, great to see you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oberstein. It's a pleasure to uh, be with you virtually, but uh, yeah. it's a pleasure to be here. This is so great because the virtual allows us <laughs> to do so many things. Dr. Uh, Dr. Craig Little is in Phoenix, Arizona. That's where CCE headquarters is. I'll just give you a little bit of a history on Dr. Little. He was practiced in California, graduated in 1983 from uh, Los Angeles uh, Chiropractic College, and he uh, practiced in 83, took the job uh, of president of CCE in 2015 and relocated from uh, Central California over to Phoenix, Arizona. Since then, he's, uh, he's got a master's in education. He now has a PhD or what we call an EDD in education from Creighton University. Uh, very well educated, uh, understands accreditation, understands education. And uh, Craig, it really is a pleasure. I, I, I'm so excited about this. You know, People think I'm crazy when my friends, you know, people have known me for how many years, you know, you know, 40 years in chiropractic. And now that I'm sitting, sitting in the seat and I start talking education and they just kind of go on tilt, like thinking I'm on tilt because they have no idea about it. And I'm so passionate about it right now. So, so let's jump in. Um, let's talk about, you know, let's talk about the historic, you know, the historical, you know, uh, chiropractic educational pathway that we where we came from, and then we'll talk about hopefully where we're going. So if you could shed some light on that, that'd be awesome. Uh, certainly. Um, as you know, um, chiropractic education originally started, um, for lack of better terminology, as mom and pop um, organizations. You know, we have the history of the Palmer family, obviously. We have the history of the Cleveland family. And so there was a lot of challenges earlier, uh, earlier on in, in chiropractic education. Um, the challenges with, um, you know, obviously with the medical profession, uh, the oppression that occurred during those times, uh, the problems, um, you know, with education leading to licensure and acceptance. Um, so there was a really long, challenging road of institutions that were, for lack of better words, single purpose. They were only a chiropractic educational program. Um, so we've seen that, and uh, essentially, um, once um, accreditation was accepted in 1974, uh, there was a, a stamp of approval upon chiropractic education that hadn't been there before. Um, over time, our educational um, programs in chiropractic have evolved. Um, you know, there are still two of our um, uh, chiropractic programs that are, that are overwhelmingly single purpose. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the institutions have involved and uh, developed other programs uh, for, of study, master's programs, other, uh, other types of health discipline programs that have been integrated. And all of our programs now are regionally accredited, which was uh, a challenge back in, the, uh, in earlier times. But now all are regionally accredited. Uh, by, um, in your case, Western Associations, Colleges and Schools, um, in, in other locations of the U.S., many different other regional accreditors. That's another stamp of approval, and all are programmatically accredited. We have, uh, you know, 16 programs at 19 educational sites right now that we accredit. Uh, there are others that are in the pipeline, so we're seeing really the continued expansion of chiropractic education, you know, not only throughout the U.S., but throughout the world. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and one thing, you know, that our viewers might not understand is 40, you know, 45 years, 46, whatever it might be, from 1974, um, 46 years, it's not a long time. No. I mean, even our profession, we're 125 years old this year, right? And it's not a long time in education when you think about schools like Harvard and Yale and Michigan being established, you know, in, in the 1800s, you know? Right. And, and here we are. You know, you know, kind of coming around, and it's it's very, you know, forty years is not a long time, and we've really made phenomenal strides. I mean, phenomenal. And and when you talk about regional accreditation, probably most of our viewers don't understand what that is. You know, that our that the accrediting is actually, you know, like us, what you mentioned, the WASP, right? You know, Western Association. You know, it's the same accreditor that accredits Stanford and Berkeley and UCLA and UC San Diego and 
you know, all and, and smaller Pepperdine and other schools at all the colleges and same thing all over across the country. Are there five accredited uh, uh, regional accreditors? Yes, and now uh, the United States Department of Education has started to recognize some other national accreditors as well. So they've blurred the lines between regional and national accreditation. But for the most part, the regionals are, uh, and those regional lines are, are blurred. They no longer exist. So programs in California can be accredited now by, um, you know, by the, uh, by many different re regions throughout the U.S. So it's yeah, so, Cal so where I am right now, it used to be if I was in the western state of California, we could only be with, with our accreditor, which is once. Correct. Now we can actually go to, we can have New England if we wanted to accredit us. It's changed the ball game, changed the landscape quite a bit. Um, but, you know, one of the things you talked about with education and chiropractic, because, you know, we know in California, we have our rules and regulations in California, obviously. And so, and, and rightfully done, it was done back in 1922, our four mothers and forefathers, you know, to protect ourselves from the, you know, in those days, right, from the medical associations and people who were attacking and doing this kind of stuff. Once again, that was back in the day. We're looking back and we'll call it the Civil Wars back then. They set up their own educational standards, you know, and and we still have to work for them. I mean, because if they're there, we're looking to change that, and our board is actively looking to change that also. But, you know, that that inhibits um, colleges and, 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 and educational institutions also because we're working off of very old laws and that's what some of our viewers wouldn't understand that, you know, and, and to, to know that, know the challenges and then as Dr. Little has, CCE has, he being our accreditor for our chiropractic program and then still having these different states with different specificities that they have that the colleges or the state or to go there to that state, you have to be able to you know, accomplish, it becomes quite a quagmire. It does, you know, I mean, back in, back in, back in the 1940s and 1950s, um, regulatory bodies, just like accreditation, were really focused on structure. You know, do, do you, did you have a brick and mortar building? Uh, do you have faculty? Um, and what was thought of as quality was sometimes, how many times did you do this before you graduated? So, you know, obviously we have quantitative requirements, a certain number of hours that the student's butt must be in the seat. And so that was a regarded as an, uh, a mark of quality. We know that we know that no longer to be true. Um, also, we had a quantitative requirement. If you did an adjustment 250 times, obviously you were competent. And so we know that that's not true. Um, we actually have many different ways that we assess whether or not a chiropractic student can competently uh, deliver an adjustment. And we expect uh, our programs, yours included, to have evidence that they're, that they're able to do that competently. But long story short, um, we've changed standards um, to, be, to align more on a competency paradigm, which is really a quality paradigm, but the states have, some states, not all, there's probably about just a few, um, probably five or less, that still have that old language in their, in their regulatory requirements that butt in the seat, need to be there 90% of the time, need to do 250 adjustments, need to do you know, 10 proctological uh, examinations, need to do 10 gynecological examinations. So that language is still buried there and programs need to be accountable to that. And we know that that doesn't align with necessarily align with a quality practitioner. Right, and, and what our viewers need to understand too is that, you know, if my program here, if, if Life West was not in California, right, if we were somewhere else, or we'll pick another school anywhere else around the country, not in California, for their students to be able to come to California, they have to teach to the regulations in California. If they didn't care about students come, to come to California, they wouldn't have to do the 90% butt in their seats and all the other prescriptive language that's there. But to give students an opportunity to do that and to be legal in what they're doing, and when they send a student to California, they have to attest that they did, they, they, the, the college outside of California followed the California laws. And so that's where this whole mix up comes in. And there's just a lot of um, challenges that we have in our educational institutions you know, to teach to that. But, you know, Craig, you, you hit it on the head when you talked about um, qualitative and quantitative, right? And we know this. And being in education now, it may take a student 350 adjustments to have the quality 
to be able to show that that, that they, they they can deliver a good adjustment. And it might take somebody else 200. Mm-hmm. But to say that 250 is the prescriptive, you know, qualitative, or, I'm sorry, quantitative, you know, a number, I get it back then, 1922, but now it just it just doesn't mean anything. And students should be able to progress. I'd like to think about a medical school saying, well, you have to do, you know, this many vena punctures. You might get it in, you know, in a shorter period of time than the person next to you, right? As long as you can prove you can do a quality, you know, the quality work qualitatively, then you can progress on, right? And that's really where, where we're kind of stuck. And it, it hurts us, you know, and um, and it's something that we're looking to change, obviously. But share with me and share with our, our, our listeners because uh, about some of the other programs that are out there, not chiropractic, other health programs. You know, we've got, we're dealing with, we've got osteopathy, we've got, you know, physical therapy, medical schools, you know, things like that, natural health schools. And you're in touch with all of them, right? Being, being you know, on the department of, under the Department of Education, right? What are you seeing? What changes are they making? What are they doing? How are they progressing? Well, um, currently, um, CCE is a member of the of ASPA, which is an association of professional accreditors. Uh, there's about 70 members. Uh, the vast majority of those are healthcare, public health, osteopathic medicine, podiatric medicine, um, you know, uh, PT, OT, uh, all the healthcare disciplines. And so we all belong to this uh, professional association. Uh, I currently sit on that board. And so we interact and we work together. For example, we'll work together on um, interdisciplinary education requirements. We'll talk about what challenges we all have. And obviously, COVID-19 has affected every healthcare discipline. And so um, we work together to try to figure out how we go through this path together. Um, but most education, health-related educational programs are really in a period of transition. There's a lot of transition because of the challenge of delivering education that is high quality, but is not busting the, ce- the, the ceiling of expenses as most programs currently have a challenge. So how can you deliver a higher quality education, perhaps with less you know, student, or, um, student debt burden, burden is a challenge for every healthcare discipline, probably more for us because other disciplines can get their loans paid down uh, somewhat easier in certain respects. Um, so we're seeing a lot of transition for, from going from a full-time institutional model of education to maybe a hybrid model of education where students are just like we're doing, you know, uh, interacting over technology and then they come together at certain points in time um, and do their clinical requirements, perhaps in their own town, and there are there are a different hospital, uh, but not necessarily on site at the institution. So we're seeing many disciplines transition to that, um, which is um, you know something. And obviously, all of higher education is looking at you know how we learn. How do we learn? Uh, do we learn just by having a faculty member sit up in front of a stage? Uh, like we learned, you and I learned, Ron, we had someone get up and they opened their mouth and, and we sat there and we tried to absorb everything that they said. And we know that that's not a good model for learning. So all programs, um, all disciplines are evolving because of the science and education in knowing how students learn. Yeah. And, we, and when you talk about like the science and learning, right? I mean, when, when, when we look at We'll just pick medicine for, for you know, for instance, because they're because they've been around for such a long time. You know, they're in school, their first year and a half, right? Basically doing science courses, right, and doing their you know doing their basic sciences, clinical sciences, and then they move out. They start to go into rotations Rotation. and residencies and things like that. So the majority of their learning is hands on, right? And what people, you know, I think most people understand this when they're awoken to it. Is that, and then after I go through my four years of medical school, and I want to, I'm going to choose to be an orthopedic surgeon. So I will then dive into orthopedic, you know, or, you know, orthopedic uh, work. And if I ever went to that person 15 years later and said, you know, my, maybe my maybe my cousin is an orthopedic surgeon, said, you know, I've got this skin rash. Can you tell me? They're going to go, I, I know nothing about. That's not me. You know, this is my specialty, right? And and I think on some level. You know, when you look at the educational models that, uh, that a lot of, like even chiropractic, a lot of colleges have, it tends to be really broad, right, and not be so necessarily as focused. You know, and I'm just talking about the educational portion, not the clinical portion, right, but the educational portion. And it's important to understand biochem, and it's important, especially if you want to go and do nutrition and do everything. 
but there's certain things that we could streamline to be able to be more um, more pinpointed, you know, for, for what we'd like to do. And I know that, you know, you talked about that with the presidents before about the colleges and, you know, areas that we're going. Um, have you seen changes in like, you know, physical therapy and just with their programs, non-COVID related, but just, you know, what are they, are, are there changes that are happening that they're looking to do to make it less expensive and to make it more, um, to produce better practitioners? Well, certainly. Um, there are many disciplines, and you mentioned one, physical therapy, where they still have, may have their traditional model, uh, of institutional model of education, but then they develop the, the hybrid program. Um, so, though, so essentially, and probably you and your colleagues in, um, in, uh, in California compete with some of these programs. Some of them are at, uh, you know, University of Southern California, for example, where they have a, a hybrid educational program. Uh, the, PT, the physical therapy program is a doctoral DPT program. Uh, it's three years in duration, not uncommon to, you know, to, uh, to what we have, um, but it's delivered in a hybrid format. So most of it is, is synchronous or asynchronous learning on, you know, via technology, um, which means you either are listening to someone live or you sometimes look at something a little later on. It's project-based. It's still, you know, you know, still a rigorous program. Requires full time attendance or full full time work, 40, 40 to sixty hours a week. But they're probably only going to be on campus about ninety days out of that three year interval. And so that's a new model um, that is enabled by not having the granular prescriptive language. It's it's innovative. It's something that that they're delivering to try to you know to make that change. It's difficult for chiropractic education to be innovative because of the fact that you've got granular restrictions in some statutory language. So you can't even think about that based on current statutory requirements. But, you know, if you're uh, that hybrid student uh, may only be at the educational program 90 days, but they'll also be immersed in clinical experiences, which are hands-on learning experiences in maybe a PT office or a hospital. So, you know, you still get, you know, students develop what they need to know, they get their skills, their values, um, and they're actively taking part of their learning, which, you know, is a self-motivation. So um, that's a uh, new concept. It's innovative. Um, it's in other disciplines, but it's, it's not currently in chiropractic. Right, right. And as you see that, I think what, the, what our learners might not understand, first of all, asynchronous and synchronous. You know, asynchronous is when you have an online course and it's, it's taped, so you don't have to sit there and listen as they're delivering it live from someplace else, right? And synchronous is when, if I'm teaching a course online, but you're literally somewhere in the world listening to it live as I teach, right? So it's, you know, it's right there. And, you know, what we see, what we're seeing at Life was, because obviously we are online right now due to COVID, um, is that our learners are learning really well. Our students are enjoying it. Um, you know, obviously it's a lot of work. They just, we shifted so quickly. Our faculty pivoted really quick. But there's certain things that they're learning better online that they feel. We've heard a lot of comments about labs online, you know, anatomy labs where they can actually see the picture of everything right on their screen instead of being in a room and having to look over something and, and catching glimpses when you have 25 people in there. Um, so there's been, and the, and the new learner, right? Right. They're not like you and I. They're not like, you know, I think if you're a chiropractor for the last, you know, 15 years, they're not, their brains are wired very differently, even probably five years, you know. Their, their brains are wired very differently. These kids have always had computers. They've grown up in a digital age. You know, they're used to doing things on, you know, digitally. That's how they visualize. That's how they learn, you know, to sit in a classroom and have someone put a PowerPoint up. They just check out, you know, because they're just not, their minds aren't meant to work like that, you know. So something we need to do. Yeah, your experience of what you've described, I've heard described by most college presidents, is the fact that we have learned, you've learned uh, so much during this interval with COVID-19, it pushed you to get out of your comfort zone and change. You had to implement change because of an immediate threat and need to keep students on course. Um, and you were able to deliver education in a, in, a, in a method that you hadn't necessarily done before, and you learned some things. You learn what works or maybe what doesn't work. Um, all of our programs have experienced that. Uh, we were blessed by the United States Department of Education allowing us to 
to, ha to provide that flexibility to programs to be innovative. Um, you know, the things we're worried about is how licensing boards may look at this down the road. Hopefully they look out upon it positively because it is a quality experience. Um, and what you've described is learning virtually. There's still so many other things out there with technology that we haven't even touched, whether it be, you know, robotics, whether it be artificial intelligence. Um, and there's so many things out there um, that um, enable student learning in a way we've never done before in a truly cost-effective manner that, that, you know, are we going to have those tools going forward? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and, and that leads us to my to my – to the question that I want to bring up and, and ask you about is just where your vision is like, like, you know, where do you see chiropractic education going, you know, and I'm not talking about tomorrow, but just, you know, what's, what's your vision? You sit and you're on the board, uh, you know, of, of the organization with all the other colleges with accreditation of healthcare, you know, healthcare colleges. What, what's your vision? What have you picked up and what do you, where do you kind of see us moving towards? Well, I mean, we, we know that uh, we have enough, knowledge from research that we know that the the structure and the content and the delivery of education is going to continue to be refined. Um, there's going to be new challenges. Right now, we just had a healthcare challenge, but there are new learning and teaching challenges. And as educators strive to ensure, you know, more seamless transition, like between the didactic and the clinical education. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's been a divide that hasn't been seamless. Uh, you know this, and especially where, where boards are placed, and it's, it's, it's rough for students. So, you know, there's a more seamless transition. Um, more educational systems are being challenged by having to prepare students for today's, you know, it's a fast-changing world. So people everywhere are trying to grasp, you know, how to engage students in their learning. And you don't engage a student in their learning by having them sit in a seat for 90% of the, of the time of the curriculum. You don't, that's not engagement. Engagement is project-based learning. It's, it's immersing them in, in certain challenges, having them reflect on those challenges. Um, you know, the research shows that, um, you know, separating the content, um, you know, um, is important. We, we used to say that, and we used to hear this program say, well, I know my student is competent because they passed their course. That's not competency, you know, I mean, because they got a 75% on a final exam or, or, or overall, that doesn't align with competency. So we need to make ensure that we have valid tools to measure those competencies, that there's multiple ones, that we triangulate it to make sure that they're, they're there. Yeah. So competency-based learning is, is truly the future. And, and, and when you talk about competency-based learning, competency-based learning can also be field learning. It could be you know, spending you know, a year or a year and a half or whatever it might be out in the field, right? Working with doctors, working in facilities, you know, working at college clinics, whatever it might be, um, you know, to be able to develop the skills that they, the skill set that they need to become, you know, not just competent chiropractors, but, you know, but good, car you know, really good chiropractors. And, and so do you see the programs, can you see like in, in your mind's eye, at least, just the shift of, of how we're delivering the programs and, and just, you know, making it be a pretty much a qualitative program and, and, uh, and, and, and away from the quantitative, you know, levels? Well, we're, expect, we're expecting uh, programs like yours uh, to come up. With, we're not going to tell you what, what ways you do it, but we're t we, we require you to have validity and reliability on, on what you do and how you assess students and how you know that they've learned. Um, so you're responsible for that. You folks come up with tools. We review them to make sure that they're, you know, that there is some uh, best practice literature supporting it, and that you're doing those things. And the delivery model obviously is, you know, um, you need to have the flexibility to use models that are uh, that are in the best interest to engage your student. Uh, right now, you're you're somewhat limited by that. Um, but, you know, hopefully that will transition in the future as well. So uh, it's exciting. You know, it's hard to, you know, three, you know, a three or four year program is not a long program when it comes to, um, you know, a doctoral level program. It's something that you have to do a lot. You have to get all your students past your board exams. You have to make sure they're competent. And you do have to do this within a real narrow window. So, um, you know, we have to look to the future and 
we're looking at that now. We're through going through a revision process in our standards to look at what's best. And so some of the things we're looking at in the future are, you know, diversity and inclusion. How can we, how can we help in that area? Uh, we're looking at in best practices and assessment. We're looking at, you know, we don't want just granular standards. We want it to reflect what chiropractors what they should know, what they should be able to do, and how to make sure that they're competent to ensure patient safety uh, once, once, once you let them go. Uh, because obviously, uh, you know, you don't take returns. And uh, right. so it's, it's, we want to make sure that they're competent by the time, time they graduate. Yeah. And, and I think our viewers um, should understand that with that, how CCE operates. There's been all sayings for the last 40 years that I've been in chiropractic, but how they operate is, you know, they allow the colleges to teach how they want to teach. You know, they allow the colleges to to use the philosophy that they want to use. The thing for us as a college is we just have to show CCE that this is the direction we want to go. This is the data that we have to show that we're actually doing what we say we're doing, right? And that it's being successful, right? And if it's not successful, that's okay. What are we doing to correct it? You know, and that's really what CCE, you know, what CCE does for us. You know, they give us better competencies, which are important to have so that we can show that somebody is competent, right, in, in, in what they're doing. Now, what is there, 32 meta competencies? Correct. Yep. And, and every program has the same meta competencies, but as far as how we deliver, what we deliver, the philosophy behind our delivery, all that stuff, it's up to the individuals. It's, it's just like in practice. You know, you can practice how you want to practice. And for the practitioners out, out you know, that, that, are, that are listening, but you also have some rules and regulations that you have with your state that you practice in, right? And they're not telling you how to practice, they're just telling you this is what's out of bounds. And, in, and even CCE, Craig, I have to tell you, you don't tell us what's out of bounds. You say, good, if that's the direction you want to go, but show us that it works. And if it doesn't work, what are we doing to correct it? You know, and, and move like that. And, 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 it's, and I found that when I got in this seat, so refreshing. And so, um, just so honest, you know, it's just an honest way of doing education that the schools can, can, can have their flavor of what they like. It's not one flavor fits all, you know, and I, and I was just so pleased with that. And, uh, and thank you, you know, for all the work. I mean, listen, I know the work you've done and I, I know that you've spoken to organizations and, and people are starting to understand what CCE does. Right. And I am thankful for CCE because, you know, you allow our educational system to continue. You're part of the you know, you're under the Department of Education, and you allow us to be free to do what we need to do as an institution, um, you know, from our roots, wherever we've grown from, and to keep traditional values uh, that from wherever we've grown from, you know, that kind of thing, and be able to change also if we want to. So thank you for that leniency, but also making sure that we're doing what we're saying we're doing. So we're delivering an educational program and put it out competent chiropractors. So I appreciate it so much. And and I and, and I hope our viewers, you know, get a get an understanding of what our educational process is like and um and everything that we go through. Uh Craig, I want to don't know if you have any final words we're gonna wrap up, but any final words that you'd like to share with our viewers or or I know that your meetings are they are they public meetings? Uh, yeah we have two meetings twice a year. Um and you know obviously they're uh uh, we, we, we go through and do accreditation business at least twice a year. Um, so it's more difficult in this because uh, obviously we're in a, we're in a, uh, we can't meet together. So, uh, but we will still, our processes still go on. And, you know, to sum up, I, have, I appreciate uh, Dr. Oberstein, your commitment to accreditation, Life West a commitment to the accreditation process. Um, your program, like all of our programs are truly committed to, uh, to the, to the, the vision that CCE has uh, regarding educational quality, uh, the commitment to ensuring that your students um, have the, the best tools to become successful. Um, and, you know, we're committed to, you know, ensuring that all programs um, are putting graduates out that are competent. There's a worldview in the profession sometimes that students from this program, uh, you know, can't diagnose and students from this program can't adjust. And there could, there's nothing further from the truth because we, the, the value that CCE has is it's quality based uh, on evidence. And we require all programs to submit a, evidence that their students are competent in all of our meta-competency outcomes, which you mentioned there are, there are over 30 of those. Uh, and we require curriculum to make sure the students are successful. So 
Um, again, and we are going to continue to improve and get better. And so we hope that uh, your program and all the programs are involved in our standards uh, review process. Yeah, and it's a big job. And, and for our viewers, uh, it's a huge lift. You know, I thought stepping into the presidency was a huge lift, you know, in a college. And then you look at someone like Dr. Little, who's got all the colleges, you know, that, that working with it. It's just a lot. There's a lot that happens. So, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Little, for your commitment to the profession, your commitment to education, and your commitment to the colleges to put out the best chiropractors possible. And I want to thank our, our, thank you, you know, our viewers for tuning into this LifeWest Leadership Line. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, the more that I can bring you in, 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 in different speakers coming on to learn different avenues around the chiropractic profession, I will continue to do. And uh, just know that uh, we want you to stay safe uh, as things are opening up right now. Um, you know, uh, just be with your loved ones. Uh, look at all the silver linings and the blessings that we have in our lives. And until we uh, come back with our next leadership line, uh, know that we're always thinking about you. Let's see you next time.